May I speak in the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Travis was about 6'5 or 6'6, around 325 pounds, and at his church in Owasso, Oklahoma, he was one of the last holdouts. He was 19. He had never walked down the aisle to make the big commitment, to take the plunge, literally. And finally, he did it. It was a Sunday night. He walked down the aisle. Alan, who was a youth minister and associate minister, met him at the front. And they walked back around the church into the closet so Alan could put on his waders. You know, the fishing waders that go up to about here. And Trevor could put on uh, some scrubs and be baptized. It was a big moment. We were all singing as we were waiting for him to come out into the water. So they turned on the lights. Everyone walked out. And we knew he was terrified of water. We knew he never liked to swim, and that was part of the reason he had waited so long. But we didn't know how truly terrified he was. Alan took his confession. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I do. Based on that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then he's going down into the water. Trevor begins to lose his mind. He begins to thrash. He begins to uh, freak out because he doesn't put his head under the water. And Alan, knowing that he's afraid and having been warned he might do this, proceeded to push harder. So he kept going and pushed him. And then he began to fight even more. And then he went harder to push him more. And as he tried to put a lot of effort into it, tried to get him under the water, water began to fill the top of his waders. Before long, he lost his balance and his entire waders were full of baptismal water. Alan went under, Trevor went under. The church was stunned silent. The most interesting part of the service, and this was interesting in all baptisms, the front about third of the baptistry was plexiglass. And as Alan began to camp, come up, Trevor was still thrashing around. He pushed Alan's face into the plexiglass, and he came up through the water with his face. And then he said, I guess that counts as a baptism. <laughs> and the church laughed for 20 minutes. Well, have you ever responded to an invitation song? Maybe you don't even know what that is if you grew up in the Episcopal Church. It's that time at the end of a sermon in the evangelical world where the preacher will probably quote the gospel we heard this morning. And they might say something like, Jesus wants to ask the disciples, who do you say that I am? And someday he'll ask you, here's your chance to answer the question. And you could answer it in your pew. You could answer it by going forward. And as a teen, I thought it was completely ridiculous, especially on Sunday night, because we knew everyone who was there. We had sat there for years with no one responding. We wonder, I wondered, why did we have to go through this exercise every Sunday night? And then on the rare occasion when somebody did respond, everyone is shocked. And they're saying, especially in the youth group, what do you think they did? What, what did they do wrong? And that's the reason I was one of the last holdouts at my church. And I never responded. I went forward. I went on a Wednesday night and snuck down with a small crowd to the baptistry. And that's how I did it. The truth is, though, it doesn't sound that bad, really. People are singing. People are ready to pray for you. Some people have been there waiting for years for somebody to finally walk down that aisle. And it's just like peace and hope and fulfillment seem to be waiting for you, just one end of the church to the other. 
We offer an invitation in our church every Sunday. It might not feel that way to you if you're used to it. But the invitation we offer is to gather around Christ's table. I remember the first time, or one of the first times I preached in the Episcopal Church, my little brother was talking to me after church, and he asked me, how many people came forward, Tom? And I said, everybody. I didn't tell him about communion. (laughs) And I remember coming forward one Sunday at my home parish, Trinity in Tulsa, to receive the Eucharist. And I remember being called up short, as they say, when the organist started playing on the organ, just as I am. And all these memories of all of these invitations came flooding back to my mind, and I was shocked. This morning, Jesus offers an invitation that is more shocking than we have made it out to be. It's a different sort of invitation. He has just fed the 4,000 in the wilderness, and this is his second time to do this in Mark's Gospel. And the religious leaders show up and they ask him, Can you do a sign to prove to us that you are who you say you are? And they're clearly not paying attention or not following him. Because in the last two chapters alone, Jesus has healed five people and twice fed thousands in the wilderness. But we can't be too hard on the religious leaders because the disciples have been there for every miracle, including the feedings. But in the very next section of Scripture, they begin to argue among themselves because one of them has forgot to pack their group lunch. And Jesus says, can't you see? Can't you hear? Do you remember how many baskets of food were left over in the wilderness when I fed the thousands? And so, to make the point for the reader, Jesus then tells a parable. But he tells the parable through a miracle. He heals a blind man. And normally in Mark's Gospel, when Jesus heals someone or does a miracle, it just happens. But not here. It happens in two steps. And first he can see, but he sees not too clearly. And then Jesus touches him again, and he's healed. And this happens to show the reader, to show us, that even those whose eyes are opened, like the disciples, for example, may not see clearly. The disciples and the leaders have seen Jesus feed thousands in the wilderness, and yet they're fighting about forgetting 12 sandwiches or 12 fish or whatever. They've seen the signs, and yet they still do not see. All of that serves as a background for the question Jesus asks in our Gospel reading. They're on a long walk from Bethesda to Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asks the question, Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And at this point, I have to do a lot of extra mental work. Because I've heard this so many times in sermons at the invitation. And I want to understand what's going on in their perspective, in the gospel, in their culture. This is not the close of church camp. This is not the end of a revival. When Jesus says, who do people say that I am, just as I am, is not playing softly in the background. Jesus is, or Peter was not the first person to walk down the aisle to be proverbial, proverbially saved. We are not that far in the gospel yet. For the first century Jew, Messiah is a political term. When Jesus tells Peter that he and the other disciples believe Jesus is the Messiah, he's saying Jesus is the physical descendant of David. He's saying he'll restore his kingdom. He's saying he'll get rid of the Romans. He's saying he'll get rid of 
puppet kings like Herod's sons. You see, Peter and the other disciples are like blind men who have only received half their sight back. And we know this is obvious because when Jesus tells the disciples what is going to happen to him, that he'll undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, Peter rebukes him. Messiahs, at least the kind that Peter is envisioning, do not suffer and do not die. In their eyes, a suffering Messiah is a failed Messiah. In their eyes, a suffering human might be a failed human. This is the middle of Mark's gospel. This is the point where everything changes. The place where Jesus stops speaking in riddles and starts speaking clearly, at least to the disciples, and begins to tell them what's really going on and what this following him will mean. And Jesus has a lot to teach his disciples, and Jesus has a lot to teach us as well. He turns to the disciples and says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will say that for what will it profit if you gain the whole world but forfeit your life? If Jesus' question is the invitation, it doesn't sound very appealing. Think about that in comparison to the invitation I used to think about. Hope, peace, fulfillment, just to walk down the aisle away. We know that's not the whole story. That's not all of the invitation Jesus is offering. The path of love your neighbor as yourself, denial of self-interest, even risk for the sake of others and Christ is not very attractive to all of us. But Jesus is inviting us to walk the same road to the cross he walked. Can you accept this invitation? Here's the good news, and here's the bad news. Jesus offers this invitation anew every day, every hour, and every minute. And there are days when you will need to decide if you are going to accept that invitation every day, every hour, and every minute. I remember when I was a little disturbed by the organist playing Just As I Am. I remember thinking about all those invitations I had sat through. But then I remember thinking about the words to the hymn. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings within and fears without, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thy love unknown has broken Every barrier down. Now to be thine, yea, thine alone. O Lamb of God, I come. This morning we'll hear an invitation. I haven't got to say that in a long time. And you can decide how you want to respond. When I think about what we proclaim in the Eucharist, what we participate in, what Jesus calls us to and what Jesus calls us into through it. How he redeemed and saved the world and all of creation, according to John 3, with his self-sacrificial love. This 
is similar to the invitation to the question he asked Peter. And it's as close as a simple walk down the aisle. 